Welcome to Seasonal Birding in Santa Clara County. This will be part one, autumn. <clears throat> and uh, this presentation draws heavily on two presentations I did earlier this year, one for Stanford, Stanford Continuing Studies about migration, uh, which is called Opportunity Wants a Map. That's available on our website. And then also Shorebirds Light, which was uh, given during the um, annual event in um, June. <clears throat> So a lot of the concepts come from those two presentations, as well as a smattering of other presentations that I've done. So the important thing to ask right now is what does fall mean for birds as well? What does it mean for birders? And that's probably why many of you are here. <clears throat> and like I always do with seasons, I like to break them down into themes because I think each season has got a different set of themes. And um, the first theme, for fall, for autumn, is moving. And that means moving to and from locations, one breeding location to a wintering location, <clears throat> as well as the uh, finding of milder conditions and the location of available food. So fairly straightforward um, goals for that season or uh, definition of moving. If you think about Many of our birds breed in the Arctic, and they certainly breed uh, north of our area. That includes most ducks and almost all shorebirds. Come fall, uh, the, uh, the days get shorter and the uh, uh, air gets cooler. <clears throat> Essentially, it gets pretty cold and ugly during winter, and even during fall, it can get pretty forbidding up there in the north. <clears throat> but those shorter days, that's really what initiates uh, a series of hormonal changes in birds those hormonal changes um, beget more changes. So what we see is something interesting called Zugenruhe. This is a German word, which means migratory restlessness. And it was first coined by Johann Andreas Nomen um, in the 1820s. <clears throat> and this is a, um, a summary of his uh, definition. In accordance with their inherited calendars, that's an important phrase. Birds get an urge to move. When migratory birds are held in captivity, they hop about, flutter their wings, and flit from perch to perch, just as birds of the same species are migrating in the wild. <clears throat> the caged birds know they should be traveling too. This migratory restlessness, or Zugenruhe, was first described by Johann Andreas Nomen, who interpreted it to be an expression of the migratory instinct in birds. So this concept has actually been pretty well uh, documented, pretty well proven. Uh, birds in captivity, I'm not sure which species this is. I think this um, photograph was taken uh, from a Euro European um, ornithologist. <clears throat> birds in captivity, uh, when they can see the sky above them and they can see the constellations and they know, they know uh, basically how the sky is looking and the temperature, they start to move around quite a bit at night, a time when they would be sleeping. <clears throat> and they get really restless, and they even orient themselves in the proper direction um, because they're looking at the stars above to tell them which direction their migratory route would generally take them. <clears throat> so this is a pretty fascinating phenomenon, pretty fascinating behavior. <clears throat> and if you think about one of our North American species, the petrel sandpiper, the stresses of the breeding season, that's the, uh, the finding of a mate, the finding of territory, the defending of that territory, the, the quarreling with rivals, the creating of the, the mating, the creating of the nest, the incubating the eggs perhaps, even, even bringing back food for some of the very young. All these stresses um, have to at some point uh, cause the bird to pause for a moment and think to itself, I'm so done with this time of year, I gotta get out of here. I got to get myself a break, get, a, get out of town. <clears throat> so that urge to leave, to move on, to do something else, to be someplace else is called migration. And uh, the, the, the urge is called Zugenrua, but what it initiates is migration. And we see sometimes birds migrating together in small groups, such as these spectral sandpipers. And it looks like uh, perhaps some Kentish plovers and it looks like a Baird's, Baird's uh, sandpipers there. Obviously not taken here, but <clears throat> these birds are, are carpooling together. 
But if we look at the map of the breeding range and the wintering range of pectoral sand viper, you see it straddles uh, both North America and Asia. <clears throat> and if you take the North American birds and you look at their wintering range in, in Argentina and Chile, etc., they could just fly directly through the center of the country. And of course, that's an option. There are four options um, for birds to travel, four migratory pathways. Um, and uh, birds can choose any one of them depending on where they're starting, what's the most convenient and what's the, uh, what's the historic route for that species. Some species venture way out over the water into South America. Birds like black, uh, black pole warbler do this. And you could, the birds, birds could uh, travel the central route or the mountain route or the uh, Pacific flyway. Birds that fly over the Pacific flyway from northern central Canada um, happens quite regularly. And that's where not only our pectoral sandpipers come from, most likely, but the occasional American golden plover. So this is a very rare bird here, but some occasionally fly due west instead of due east <clears throat> from their breeding grounds to the south. Now, by the same token, birds that nest in Asia, such as uh, northeastern Asia, um, uh, would generally travel the Western Pacific or the Eastern Asian landmass toward New Zealand and uh, Australia. <clears throat> and by the same token, some of those birds might just as likely or less likely, but, but often travel down the Pacific, the Eastern Pacific or the Western United States. <clears throat> birds like that, that make that choice um, would be like the sharp-tailed sandpiper, extremely rare here. But when it shows up, it has come from Siberia and uh, has taken that alternative route. <clears throat> so you have to wonder why birds migrate at all. Um, and I think most obviously it's the, the, it's the pursuit of milder conditions. It's why we all go on vacation during the winter to find nicer places, <clears throat> um, at least growing up the East Coast, we would always travel in, in the winter to get away from the ice cold there. Well, in the North, far North, it's more of an extreme situation. So birds leaving the Arctic tundra, which is windy and cold and increasingly dark. <clears throat> birds from the either boreal forest or deciduous woodlands in, in Canada are fleeing the areas, especially the insectivores, um, in search of areas that are warmer and uh, more productive for the food that they like. <clears throat> Likewise, birds that rely on water for their nesting uh, cycle, like a yellow-headed blackbird. Yellow-headed blackbirds would not be comfortable here at all. So when this area dries up seasonally, they take off and find other places elsewhere. <clears throat> the importance of seasonal food uh, really can't be overstated. We have an abundance of flying insects during spring and summer, <clears throat> but many fewer during fall and winter. So we have a reduced supply of, of uh, the flying insects for birds that time of year. They're still here, but fewer of them. What we do have is an abundance of seeds. So seed bearing plants like thistle and sunflowers, of course, they're laden with seeds um, during the fall and winter. And that's when birds stock up uh, for the winter on those foods. Of course, we have an abundance of fruit bearing trees and bushes, coffee berries, a famous one. So a lot of fruit eaters will uh, take refuge here. So what happens is during the fall, we have a lot of departures from our area. We've got mostly the insectivores, the vireos, the orioles, the warblers, the tanagers, etc. <clears throat> Not to say that they never eat anything else, but they eat primarily insects. And there are a lot fewer of them during fall and winter. These are all neotropic migrants. Um, on the flip side, we've got arrivals of birds that uh, forage on seeds, forage on grass and greens, uh, ground foraging birds, and water birds. We have most of our migrants, or most of our arrivals this time of year, fall into one of these categories. So if you look at the checklist, and I encourage you all to use your checklist, uh, it's just as important as your field guide. Every checklist tells a story. And here are my four of my best selling uh, stories. 
the greater yellow legs you see from january to december it's fairly obviously present but you see that little dip between may and june well, that's the breeding season so while the greater yellow legs is here year round <clears throat> some of those birds depart to breed in canada the ones that we see here are birds that are either too young to breed don't feel well enough to breed or for whatever reason just decided not to breed this year so there's a story told there in that slight dip in numbers between April and uh, July. Black chinned hummingbird is a neotropic species that breeds in Southern Cal in Santa Clara County, but it winters to our south. And that's why you don't see it on this checklist from January to March or from October to December, basically our entire winter. <clears throat> Red-breasted sapsucker is here exactly the opposite time frame. It's a wintering species that's completely absent during the breeding season. And then my favorite story is what I call pass-through species. So these are birds that fly through our area, occasionally land to forage and feed and build up for a day or two. Solitary sandpiper is a perfect example. We see it in April in small numbers, and then we see it in somewhat larger numbers, August through September. So those in April are the birds flying north to their breeding grounds from areas south of us. They reach their breeding grounds from May through July. And then on the return journey, August through September, they pass through our area again. And they're continuing south through our area. But during this time is when we should look for them. And they're going to show up in places that you could probably predict. This same story, this same best-selling narrative is true of the two phalaropes we see, Wilson's and Red-Necked. They're uh, right now to be found in great numbers in the Alviso salt ponds and Don Edwards. A solitary sandpiper, we've had uh, two or three already in the county in just this past week. <clears throat> so here are a few fall arrivals that you probably are all familiar with, um, <clears throat> but I'm gonna go through them because they each fall to different categories. We've got the pine siskin there, which is a seed eating species. And we've already mentioned how there's an abundance of seeds this time of year. So it would make sense that we'd see more seed eaters. We've got the cedar waxwing and the hermit thrush, both avid fruit eaters. So they'll eat berries off of bushes, and so will robins. And there are a lot of berries to be found right now and through the winter. But hermit thrush also falls into another category, which I called hardy insectivores. So we've already mentioned how insects are a little bit harder to locate. There are fewer of them um, during the cooler months, but they're still here. And only the hardy, hardiest of the insectivores can find them or decide to uh, search for them this time of year when it's more difficult. So the hermit thrush uh, clearly uh, eats a lot of insects, mostly mostly uh, invertebrates like worms and beetles and things like that. The ruby crowned kinglet clearly eats lots of gnats and insects um, off of the leaves and branches. The yellow rumped warbler uh, fly catches to find a lot of its insects, uh, both in the trees, um, on the outer branches, on the ground, on the tree trunk. So uh, it's a real generalist and very hardy. And finally, the red breasted sapsucker. You wouldn't necessarily think of a woodpecker as being an insectivore, but in fact, they really are. The bulk of their diet is insects. So while they drill their holes, which makes this sap kind of seep, uh, they're going to drink that sap. It's high in sugars, etc. But it's also going to attract a lot of insects, ants particularly. So they're going to eat those ants too. So they get high protein and high sugars. <clears throat> and then we've got a couple of water birds. All the ducks, all the geese are water birds. Um, and especially with the geese, they're going to forage on the green lawns. <clears throat> and then the uh, long-billed dowager and, and many of the shorebirds are, are mud specialists. They're probing in the mud for worms and other invertebrates that they find below the surface and along the water's edge. So all of these birds are finding great opportunities in fall um, here, whether they're passing through or they're arriving for the duration of the season. So the second main theme is changing, changing plumage, changing one's diet. So let's talk about plumage first. So Western tanagers, of course, are brilliantly colored 
And those colors during uh, fall begin to appear worn and dull by summer's end. And we see something more like this. It takes a lot of energy to maintain these beautiful colors. It takes energy to produce those colors. And uh, by the time we get to fall, the birds are kind of um, indulging in a, in, a, in a casual Friday, let's say. So that they have, they, some of the colors have actually worn off. Some of the feathers actually change, but they're much more subdued, less conspicuous. That's probably an important thing. And um, also they, they don't want to waste a lot of energy producing bright new feathers right now. Yellow rumped warbler. <clears throat> Of course, it's, if you've seen it in the Sierra during the spring and summer, you know how beautiful it is. By the time we get it, it's quite drab. Most of those colors have worn away or faded away uh, through abrasion, uh, UV exposure, or just wear and tear. <clears throat> so these birds uh, are changing all over the place. Yellow rumped warb uh, sorry, yellow warblers. Even the females are quite beautiful and bright, not as bright as the males, uh, but we also see some of them dulling down uh, during the fall. And then, of course, we see a bunch of youth, the very young birds, which are very dull. We'll get more to the, the young and old birds shortly. I love gulls, and some of you do too, And uh, but they are difficult. They are difficult because not only do they have different plumages, depending on how old they are, as many as four different plumages there, but uh, they also have winter plumages and breeding plumages. So the fall plumage here of this California gull, you can see how it's dulled down. The spots have occurred, have appeared on the head and neck and face. The bill has actually changed colors a little bit. So a lot of change is going on this time of year. If you take this western sandpiper, it's an early summer adult. They're really flashy and beautiful. The color is really pronounced. By the time we see them in late summer, they have really started to wear down a little bit all the pretty full pretty colors and uh, pale fringing on the back feathers have started to wear away and uh, what we're left with is a pretty a pretty worn out ragged looking bird in late summer by winter some of those feathers have been replaced by new feathers but they're dull and undifferentiated so it takes less energy to produce these and um, it gives them a very different appearance what happens after that is we start to see the fall juveniles appear in our area. These are birds are already here and they're right beside the winter adults. So you really have to recognize both the adult and the juvenile of the sandpipers. And you might think it could be difficult to differentiate the early summer adult with the fall juvenile, but, but look at those titles. Those two birds don't really come into contact very much. What you're left with is the winter adults or the very, very late summer adults that are quite ragged and um, uh, less, less tidy in their appearance. We talked an awful lot about shorebird juvenile plumage in the shorebird class. Um, and uh, it's, it's one of the best times to look for shorebirds actually because the young birds are so different and so beautiful compared to the kind of ragged adults at this time of year. A lot of birds change their diet uh, from spring to fall. Now, these are different species, but what I'm trying to get at here is that sparrows in general, we associate them with eating seeds and cracking seeds. That's why we've learned they've got these really husky conical bills. They're perfectly designed for cracking nuts and seeds. That's true, but for a full half of the year, they're actually eating more insects. The savannah sparrow on the left is famous for eating hundreds and hundreds of insects, uh, mayflies, worms of various kinds, feeding it to the young uh, for a high protein diet and also benefiting from that high protein diet themselves. High protein and high fat. And then we've got the, the white throated sparrow here on the right eating seeds during the fall and winter, which is high fat and high carb. So uh, it's building up during these season where the insects are, are diff more difficult to find. <clears throat> yellow rumped warbler, of course, all warblers eat insects, but yellow rumped warbler, one reason it's able to spend its winter with us and some other areas north of here is because they're so hardy. They actually have no problem visiting a seed feeder to grab even something as large as a sunflower seed. 
So uh, they're getting a different kind of diet. They're making use of the food that's available. They've differentiated their, their food intake, which is why they're considered so hardy. Many other warblers probably can't do that. American robins, we've all seen them um, pulling worms out of the ground, finding beetles and things like that in the grass. But during the fall and winter, of course, we find them most often during uh, rich berry producing bushes. So a lot of the foods that are available um, are being utilized by the arrivals, what we get here. The third theme, um, recovering. The stress of breeding uh, and the need to replenish after the journey. So as that suggests, the demands of breeding are, they, they're followed by this long journey. And of course that takes a serious toll on our migrant birds. They often exhaust their reserves uh, during that long trek. And we see here a perfect example of just that. Now, these are two birds. I'm not sure the species or uh, where this photo was taken, but it demonstrates the, the perfect uh, situation where the bird on the left, that yellowish buttery colored uh, blob on the belly, which has been exposed by parting the feathers, is fat reserves. So the bird utilizes those during a long uh, migration. On the other end of the migration, uh, we see a bird with no fat reserves remaining whatsoever, an exhausted bird that's burned up all its fuel. That bird on the right is not likely to travel any farther, <clears throat> at least not until it replenishes uh, some of its reserves. We've seen uh, some songbirds and some shorebirds lose a full half of their body weight during a long journey, especially the long distance migrants like bar-tailed godwit, prants, uh, uh, Baird Sandpiper and Black Pole Warbler. So a lot of energy is taken and they need to recoup. So how do they recoup? They're going to feed voraciously. And these Dunlin here are gathering by the hundreds or thousands on a suitable mud flat, like we have so many of here in Santa Clara County. And they're filling up, they're replenishing themselves. Some will remain here, others will continue farther south but they all need to, to fuel back up after a long journey from Canada and Alaska. Preparing. Uh, so they're regaining their strength, their, their lean times are ahead, and there are, of course, safety in numbers. We see the safety in numbers concept really strongly with cedar waxwings. Uh, during fall, uh, birds that are not normally as gregarious uh, as they are in winter, uh, start forming these groups in fall. And those groups can become um, 100 birds or more together. The cedar waxwings do this because the food they're searching for is not easy to find. Well, ton berries are, it's, it's very useful to have a group to help find the, uh, find the resources. You see this even with, uh, with vultures, it's forming large groups to search for food together. Sooty shearwaters. Uh, this is a pretty typical situation off of our coast during the summer. And these birds remain here uh, through the fall. They have come all the way from New Zealand. And if you think about when they arrived in summertime, if they came from New Zealand, it was their winter in the Southern Hemisphere. So they have done a, a, what can be considered a reverse migration, an austral migration. Basically, the exact opposite of what we see. Birds in the north during winter come south um, in fall to experience warmer uh, temperatures to the south. These birds fly north to experience uh, more suitable conditions in the north. So anyway, uh, it's a unique situation, but uh, it's curious to think about how they arrive here during their winter, and yet it's summer here, and they remain through fall before they begin their journey back south to New Zealand. Sandhill cranes, well, we know they start arriving uh, in fall, close to maybe Thanksgiving or so is when we start to look for them. And um, during that time, we start to see the beginnings of uh, formation of bonds and the strengthening of, of prior bonds, existing bonds. This is because during the fall and winter, they've, they've, they've traveled here a long journey from Alaska, most often, and they've gotten here and they're 
if, uh, to anthropomorphize, they're probably celebrating the fact that they've arrived on their wintering grounds. And they take that opportunity after replenishing themselves to strengthen the bonds that exist or form new bonds for the upcoming breeding season, which will occur in spring. All of our zonotrichia sparrows, the white crown, the golden crown, they form large groups, but only during the fall and winter. And the bush tits that you see um, in along the, the hedgerows in the springtime, you see one or two, but during the fall and winter, you start to see many more of them. Groups of 10, 20, or even 30 are not uncommon. The safety in the numbers, of course. It's protection for the flock. It's also uh, making use of the uh, search and discovery skills of each bird to help the group find food. Attracting. Resource rich areas are magnets for birds. And the fuel stops that I uh, touched on are crucial for bird survival. In our area, in our county, we've got tons of places that are magnetic for birds. Ponds with dense vegetation where any remaining insects can be found. Uh, um, all kinds of uh, creatures in the water and on the shore to be searched for and, and eaten. Deciduous groves for the same reason as the ponds with the uh, vegetation. Any insect life that is still in the area can be found here fairly easily. Mud and irrigated fields are good for uh, creepy crawlies that are uh, underneath the surface, but there's also just the presence of water. Water is extremely important for migrating birds. Native plants, of course, support many insects and fruits and berries that are uh, perfect for migrating birds, whether they're arriving or whether they're just stopping for food. And they also provide protective cover, which is wonderful. Birds need to be uh, alert and find cover um, when they're not flying. Fruit, like these coffee berries, uh, of course, hugely important for migrating birds. And even though they're not native here, persimmons are a real magnet for birds. There's a magic persimmon tree at uh, Piketty Ranch, which pretty much year after year attracts uh, warblers, both yellow rumped townsends, uh, will attract red-breasted and sometimes yellow-bellied sapsuckers, will attract purple finches, cedar waxwings, uh, you name it, will end up in these persimmon trees. They're, they're eating the, the uh, decaying fruit and they're also eating the insects that are attracted to the, to the decaying fruit. Pistache trees, again, not native here, but a magnet for our occasional evening grosbeaks, western bluebirds, yellow-rumped warblers, so keep your eye out on the pistache trees on Stanford campus and in uh, uh, Los Altos. Eucalyptus, um, not native here. Uh, of course, they, uh, they have a, a flowering schedule that's different from most of our species here. We have a lot of flowering eucalyptus in fall and even winter. So they attract insects. They also uh, have a kind of a sweet residue, which is nutritious and um, so we find a, lot, find a lot of birds gravitating toward these non-native plants. But there's also these red gum lerpsilids, which is a little parasitic plant which came from Australia. Uh, sometime about 30 years ago, I believe they started to show up in, in California. It's surprising they didn't show up earlier. But if you went to go see the rose-breasted grosbeak at Lake Cunningham, you might have noticed that a lot of the birds were were uh, making use of the eucalyptus leaves. What they were doing is not eating the fruit, they were eating these lerpsilids, which are little insects. Fennel, of course, um, non-native. Again, I seem like I'm talking an awful lot about non-native, but that while it is true they're non-native and we prefer not to see so many non-native species, it can't be denied that some of the non-natives really do have a value for our migrating birds. Fennel is quite famous for attracting uh, warblers, flycatchers, vireos. Some of our most wonderful and unexpected species have been found in small patches of fennel, just like this. And if you've been along the coast of Cascade Ranch, you know they used to pile up all the rotting uh, uh, Brussels sprouts in one corner of a field. That rotting pile of Brussels sprouts would decay and soften and stink and be a horrible mess. But what it would do would be attract all kinds of life forms and, and create all kinds of life 
that uh, the birds, the migrant birds, would love. So not only insects, beetles, worms, um, other birds would come here, uh, mammals of various kinds, all potentially good food for migrants. Willows provide not only a great cover, but they're usually uh, in or near water. So it's a signal to migrant birds that there might be something worthwhile in this grove. And just the presence of water anywhere can attract birds, especially during a dry season like we have here. A three or four year drought, water is precious, almost more than anything. And uh, the birds uh, have to find it. So leaking irrigation, hoses, pipes, sprinklers, uh, anybody who's making, uh, doing uh, watering their lawns or sprinkling or a golf course, these areas attract birds, not just because of the, the life to be found in the grass or in the water, but the water itself. Discovering. These are some of the common and a few not so common fall birds that uh, we should all be looking for right now. <clears throat> Among the raptors, we've got Merlin, which for me is a signature species of fall. When I see the Merlin in our neighborhood, I know that fall has arrived. And I also know that it'll remain here through the winter. Um, we've had one in our uh, driveway every winter for the past, I think, nine years. Uh, it's been two different individuals, as far as we can tell. That was a male. Here we have a female. This is a small falcon, not much bigger, you know, proportionally. Uh, than a kestrel, but it is bulkier, heavier, and flies much more like a small peregrine. It's relatively common. So if you watch the power lines, the phone poles, the uh, power towers, uh, you might just see a Merlin up there sometime. Another raptor, Ferruginous hawk. This is a bird of the prairie states, so it does migrate here, although not very far. And it goes to areas that resemble its uh, prairie homeland. So rolling grassland, agricultural fields, places like that. Coyote Valley and Coyote Ridge, those rolling grasslands up above um, Ed Levin Park and into uh, the neighboring San Antonio Valley, great places to look for ferruginous hawk. This is a big bird, uh, shockingly pale on the underside. We went into great depth uh, about Ferruginous Hawk in the Raptor series, and this is an adult. You could tell by the, by the dark reddish pantaloons that it's wearing. And it comes in a dark morph too, which could easily be confused with the Golden Eagle, but uh, the Golden Eagle is down below. And uh, there are significant differences there between the, the two birds' shapes. <clears throat> no matter what color morph you're looking at with the Ferruginous hawk, that you're going to notice these three points of light at the base of the primaries, on the top surface of both wings, and then also the rump and the tail. So three points of light means that it's not a, not a red-tailed hawk. And that's important to remember because really 95% of the hawks we see are going to turn out to be red-tailed hawks. So a, a pointer like this might help you recognize something that's not a red-tailed hawk. Among the flycatchers, now I've already made it clear there aren't that many, there aren't as many insects around here, but the, the insect, the, the flycatchers that come through right now are often passing through. Willow flycatcher is a perfect example. It's about the size and roughly the shape of a Pacific slope, but this willow flycatcher has no eye ring and a very wide square tail. Like its name suggests, it's often found um, near water and in willows but not always. It also has been found in fennel patches like that. And just for comparison, the Pacific Slope Flycatcher, which is also passing through our area now and still here in good numbers, uh, has a pretty conspicuous eye ring and a lower mandible that's sort of yellowish orange. And look at how narrow that little tail is. So some important structural differences here. Says Phoebe, a really common winter, fall and winter flycatcher, will begin to show up any day. So watch for this one when you're out in more dry areas. Black Phoebe often is found near water along creeks and in, in woodland uh, where water is uh, present at least. 
The sage phoebe doesn't mind being away from water. It can be out in a very dry, scrubby field. <clears throat> but it is quite a beautiful bird, subtly different in shape, longer wings, longer tail, and consequently, a, a very different flight style. It's more, more wafty, more buoyant when it flies, more like a bluebird than uh, the black phoebe is. Tropical kingbird is a curious situation in that the name suggests it's found in the tropics, which it is year round in Mexico and in Central America. But after breeding, some of those northern birds in northern Mexico, of all things, they migrate north. No one knows exactly why, uh, but they're just sort of exploring the area and making use perhaps of the lack of competition. So the western kingbird has all but left the area. Tropical kingbirds move in briefly during fall. So most of our reports of tropical kingbird are during the fall months of September and October. Um, it's important to notice some of the difference because the western kingbird has got a black tail and much less yellow on the throat and, and breast. You can see it here. The green is quite, the back is quite green on a tropical kingbird. The bill is longer. The yellow extends higher up on the breast and the tail is deeply notched and it's olive colored. So quite a few differences there to note. I would look for this bird uh, near golf courses like the uh, Palo Alto golf course or the Shoreline golf course. Look for it on Gang Road where we had two last fall. <clears throat> While this bird has been pretty easy to find, the Vermilion flycatcher, um, in fact, it stayed year round, stayed all through the summer at Grant Park and I believe it's still there. But what I'm encouraging you to do is look for birds that occur during fall, which is where they usually show up in other counties, fall and winter. So having a breeding, uh, breeding season vermilion flycatcher present in Santa Clara County was a bit odd. And I keep thinking we ought to start looking for them in fall and winter. And most especially, I think, uh, keep a watch out for the females. The reason being that pinkish rosy color on the belly and flanks on the younger birds is sort of pale yellow. So if you take away that reddish rosy color and you replace it with a pale yellow, what do you have? Something that's pretty nondescript and easily overlooked. So now watch for this bird. I, I have a feeling one will show up in fall again. By the same token, Eastern Phoebes in Santa Clara County have generally showed up in winter, but I think it's time for one to show up in fall because again, in the counties surrounding Santa Clara, this bird has often showed up in fall. So this looks an awful lot like a black Phoebe except with a pale throat. So shorebirds, this is a big category here. Um, and uh, for more information about the shorebirds, check out the shorebirds light um, presentation on the website. So Dunlin here is the second from the left bird, smaller than the, than the Dowagers, uh, curved bill and more uniform coloration. And the way I recognize it is it has almost no facial features. So it looks kind of expressionless. And for that reason, I kind of jokingly call it the Dunlin. <laughs> it looks kind of vacant. Um, kind of not terribly smart. And I know that's unfair, but that's the impression I get from Donlin. <laughs> they have a characteristic hunching pattern, hunching profile uh, posture when they're feeding. And they form pretty large groups. I've shown you this image already. Uh, large groups of one species uh, looking fairly tan, fairly uniformly tan, and all quite uh, brainless. Hopefully you can see the Dunlin in this group of dowagers here. It's right in the front with the, the more uniform coloration on the back and the shorter, slightly curved bill. Ruff is another bird. And I really expect one of you to find a ruff in the next few days because this is the time where they start to show up full. So this is a long distance migrant uh, from Asia that uh, has taken the route uh, down the our west coast instead of from the uh, going down the the east coast of Asia. 
So it has a plain breast and a kind of a pot-bellied structure. It's a fairly large bird with a short bill and a really small head, strange proportions. It has a kind of an unusual pattern of white on the back that looks like a white V or a U. <clears throat> Maybe you can pick it out here. We've got a greater yellow legs, a black necked stilts, and that rough there on the left with a real short bill, a little bit smaller than the yellow legs. <clears throat> it's important to remember that the males are considerably larger than the females, so the size may or may not be too helpful to you. This bird, like the Dunlin, has very little, very few features on the face. And the bill and length of bill are kind of similar to the Dunlin, maybe a little bit shorter than the Dunlin. But these, these uh, expressionless birds uh, stand out, at least to me. Ruffs also tend to have long back feathers and tertials, and they fluff up quite a bit uh, in the slightest breeze, like this. I'm hoping that you can pick out the ruff in this picture. If you've guessed that it's the bird in the middle, that's correct. We've got a long billed dowager on the left and a uh, looks like a greater yellow legs on the right and a rough in the center. Look how pale that face is and how it lacks an eye stripe or an eye ring or anything that would make that face um, expressive. Here again. Now, I wonder if anybody recognizes the bird in front. The rough is in the middle. Again, the greater yellow legs, the rough in the middle, and the bird in the foreground is a stilt sandpiper. This has not been seen in the county for about seven years, but there is one right now at the Knob Hill Pond in, in Foster City. So I guess a smart birder would be on the lookout for a stilt sandpiper to be coming through our area on its way farther south. Pectoral sandpiper, that I opened up the discussion about migration of a pectoral sandpiper, differs from the rough in having a finely patterned streaks on the breast. But otherwise, kind of similar in shape, at least, to the rough. Here it is next to a, a willet. So not a big bird, smaller than the rough, most likely. It's got stripes on the back, kind of like a snipe. Um, hopefully you can pick the the pectoral sandpiper out of this group. We've got dowagers in the foreground and the rough, sorry, the pectoral sandpiper in the back. And like a lot of our long distance migrants, it has really long wings. So the rough, the pectoral sandpiper and the bared sandpiper all have very long wings. They need those long wings to go all the way south of the equator. So, uh, Shorebirds with exceedingly long wings like this, you can almost guarantee that they're long distance migrants. And just to uh, draw the, make the point that Petrel Sandpiper and Wilson Snipe uh, are a little bit similar, you could see the pattern of these two birds in the grass looking uh, possibly confusing. Here again, look at the yellow at the base of the pectoral sandpiper. I'm showing a lot of pictures of pectoral sandpiper because it hasn't been seen yet this season, but it's right about time. So I would watch for this bird. They tend to walk around a lot in vegetation um, on the water's edge. So Don Edwards would be perfect because there's all that pickle weed. And um, of course there are the shallow ponds so it could forage in the ponds along the edges and then take shelter in the weeds. Such a beautiful bird. And I forgot to mention that many of our less common shorebirds that we receive in fall are juveniles. So they're usually quite colorful and very beautifully patterned. It's important to remember though, that pectoral sandpiper and least sandpiper have similar coloration. Not only the legs are both yellowish and the top, the upper surfaces are um, reddish and uh, golden. And there tends to be a bit of a bib on a least sandpiper, not so much on this individual. But look at these two birds, and it's easy to see how they could be confused. In fact, they are an awful lot um, confused with each other. But the way to pick them apart is proportionally, the pectoral sandpiper has a much smaller head. 
which is the result of the bird being twice as large. The, the head of the two sandpipers, the, um, the head is much larger in relation to the body in the least sandpiper, and that usually suggests a smaller bird. In any case, the pectoral sandpiper is about twice the size of a least sandpiper, but they are found in similar habitat and they have similar coloration. So be sure to compare your shorebirds with each other. Like I mentioned before, we've had lots of solitary sandpipers so far for, uh, for Santa Clara County. I think we've had three. And this is another, it's, it's like a small, dull, uh, uh, dingy colored um, olive leg. <laughs> not, a, not, a, not a lesser yellow legs, but a lesser olive legs. So the legs are not bright yellow, but sort of olive colored. It's darker on the back with delicate spots. And as everybody always comments, the very conspicuous eye ring. This is smaller than a lesser yellow legs and quite different in a number of respects. The underside of the wings are very dark and the rump is really quite dark on this bird. Contrast that to the lesser yellow legs, which is the most similar species. It's got a pale tail and very white underneath the wings. But they both have fairly short bills and very delicate birds, so easily mistaken. Now I'm gonna zip through a few sparrows um, just, for, just for good measure. Everybody probably knows the white-crowned sparrow, the adult on the left and the juvenile on the, on the right. <clears throat> and the golden-crowned sparrow, these are both adults. These will be rushing into our area in the next couple of weeks. I've already seen uh, a couple of white crowned sparrows. I haven't seen any golden crowned sparrows yet, but they're on their way. And when they get here, um, our feeders will be filled with both species. It's exciting to watch um, because at the same time, we, we start to get Lincoln's sparrows. This is like a very delicately painted song sparrow or possibly Savannah sparrow, but look at that buffy coloration that occurs on the upper breast sort of in between the other streaks. This is a, a key feature for this little bird as well as the gray supercilium. It's a pretty shy little bird and less common than any of those prior sparrows is the white-throated sparrow, but it's common enough that most people will be able to find one during the fall or winter. And we've, we've had several at the ranch. Not yet though, still a little bit early. You'll want to make sure that you are, can recognize the young bird because, as I have said before, many of the birds we get that uh, arrive in fall are young, young birds, including the white-throated sparrow here. Clay-colored sparrow is, is rare, but we've been getting them pretty much every year for the past 10 years or so. And uh, so I definitely watch out for them. This is a small Spazella sparrow. The only thing you're likely to confuse it with would be chipping sparrow, which is more common, yes. But during fall, all three of the spazellas, the brewers, the clay colored, and the chipping, are found kind of in equal numbers. So keep that in mind. The clay colored, I think, is, is probably the, the one that uh, is very likely to show up. <clears throat> and finally, Vesper sparrow. This is a bird unlike the clay colored, which likes thickets and, and uh, dense cover. The uh, Vesper Sparrow really likes wide open fields, dried fields, the same places you might find Savannah Sparrow or American Pivot. So watch for this. Uh, last year we had two of them at Shoreline Lake. The kinglets, there's nothing rare or uh, surprising about the kinglets. I think everybody can identify it. You wanna watch for this dark stripe at the base of the secondaries. That's key because the Hutton's Vireo lacks that. Plus, if you get a good look, you can see the yellow feet here and look how delicate and spindly the leg bone is. If you're really lucky, uh, the bird is flirting or you piss it off, uh, it might show that bright red on the crown, but not so much during the fall. You know, it's, it's done with the breeding. It's still um, aggressive for a little bird but it's gonna show that red feature less often when it's visiting us. The golden crown kinglet is much harder to find and it likes conifers quite a bit more than the uh, ruby crown kinglet. Some people, I think Barry's even seen them on the valley floor um, and occasionally that happens, but this is the tougher of the two kinglets to find. 
I didn't see any golden crowns last year myself, but Sanborn Park or the John Nicholas Trail would be excellent spots to look for them. Um, the, the last theme is surprising. So Preston, make me a martini. And if you don't haven't heard that story, trust me, there's a funny story that goes with that, uh, that quotation. Sometime I'll tell you, but, but not right now. Just trust me, it's a funny story. And anytime I see a rare bird, uh, I, I think to myself or I say out loud, Preston, make me a martini. Part of that has to do with the concept called mis mirror misorientation. And mirror misorientation is the phenomenon where birds that you don't expect to see here in the West show up in the West. This is the map for black pole warbler. And you can see in the status bar up above that September to October is the time of year to find it in Santa Clara County. So what happens is that they generally migrate from Canada and the eastern portion of the states directly over water to Brazil. And a very small number of those birds, for some reason, no one's quite sure why, they reflect that journey to the west. That's called mirror misorientation. It's a, a malfunction, I suppose, in the navigation system or perhaps a frontier spirit. But some small numbers of those uh, typically eastern birds show up in California. And there are tons of them. So don't let those range maps lull you into believing that those eastern warblers never show up here, because they do. All you have to do is look at our checklist of warblers, and this isn't even the entire list. Look at all the eastern birds, including, uh, let me see, uh, um, American Red Start, Magnolia Warbler, Cape May Warbler, Northern Perula, bay-breasted warbler, black burnian, et cetera, chestnut-sided, black pole, black and white, black-throated blue, palm. All those birds are what we consider eastern warblers. Now, the theme of surprising during uh, fall is because fall is the time, September to October, to look for these rare and wonderful surprise birds. <clears throat> and they're very confusing sometimes. The field guides have long made fun of them and call them uh, confusing fall warblers because they're all kind of greenish yellow and very uh, flitty and uh, hard to tell apart. They're only hard to tell apart if you don't try because they can be divided immediately into two groups, the ones with wing bars and the ones without. And beyond that, you've got other features to look at, including the undertail. So you can look at the undertail pattern or no pattern. By the time you break down a few features, and I'm talking about whether it's got an eye ring, whether it has a supercilium, whether it has a plain yellow face or wing bars, or whether the rump is yellow. If you, uh, if you check off a few of those features and you also perhaps notice something of its behavior, whether it wags its tail or whether it fly catchers or whether it forages on the trunk of a tree, you're gonna to start to notice differences more quickly than the field guides would lead you to believe. Just trust me, it will start to become natural. Look for those features. Look for the wing bars first. Look for the streaks on the breast first. Um, <clears throat> and watch for the behavior and notice where you see the bird. And um, if it compares in size or shape or markings to some of the other nearby birds. This black pole warbler here. Black pole warbler in its breeding plumage is black and white. And right here we see a lemony yellow and green bird. This goes back to the changing uh, theme. This is the basic plumage of the bird, the plumage it'll keep through the winter. And the undertail view, which is what you see most often on some of these treetop birds. And uh, black pole often visits the ground. Uh, it's not what every warbler does, but black poles do. Here's a pretty good unobstructed view of black pole warbler. We had one of these at uh, Vasona Lake last year. And it is a pretty lemony, yellowish green bird with a very, very white undertail and belly. Even though it might not strike you as um, uh, noticeable for these pictures, when it does show up in front of you, the first thing you'll think is, gosh, that's not like the other warblers I've seen. One of my favorite surprises of fall is the northern water thrush. This is, a, this is a bird that loves the shadows and loves water and it's constantly bobbing its tail and it really does look like a, a thrush of some kind. But it's in fact a warbler and you usually find it near 
water. I was planning on visiting Visona to look for uh, the uh, northern water thrush there where I'd seen it last year. But I think Carter and perhaps Eve told me that the, that the lake was really quite dry and the creek was completely dry. So I might have to locate another area to look for the northern water thrush. But this is a neat little bird, really very different from our other warblers. Palm warbler is another one, kind of a nondescript uh, thrush-like or even a, looks like a pipit perhaps, except for the yellow underneath the tail and the fact that it bobs its tail constantly. But here you see this, you might pass over this bird pretty quickly. Um, you know, the pipits wag their tails also. And they, these, uh, this is one of the most ground loving warblers we have. It frequently visits the ground and, and isn't, doesn't really like the cover of a northern water thrush, which is also found on the ground. The palm warbler is perfectly happy being in exposed sunlight out the open on the, on the lawn or in the dried grass. It's got pretty, pretty conspicuous markings on the tail as well, but look at the undertail, how bright that is. It's the brightest part of the bird is the undertail. Here again, looking kind of nondescript and thrush-like. This is a pretty common vagrant in our area. This one is not so common. This is Tennessee warbler. It looks an awful lot like an orange crown, but I, I wanted to point out how bright the undertail is. And if that didn't get your attention, um, then uh, it probably should. This is the best way to tell the Tennessee warbler is a, a bird that looks like an orange crown but has a white undertail. There are other differences, but those are probably the most important ones right now. This is not common here. We didn't have one last year, but I think we had one the year before. Black Bernian warbler. At first glance, it might strike you as a Townsend's, but the, the yellow on the face is actually slightly more orange, more peachy coloration. But look at those stripes on the back. That's crucial. If you can see that on a, uh, on a black pole, a black Bernian warbler, then you've seen the best feature. More than the orange coloration, uh, probably those back streaks, those pale streaks that look like straps down the back. Good marks. The wing bars are really conspicuous, very bright. This bird here is not so bright or colorful, but the facial features uh, make it a black burning warbler. Magnolia warbler. This was at Eulostack a couple of years ago, or maybe it was just last year. A bunch of people went to go see it. It likes cover, it likes bushes, it likes uh, small trees, dense cover, but um, beautiful bird, quite unlike our other warblers, and has some really interesting shocking features. The tail pattern, and like I've always said, uh, if a warbler or a bird of any kind has got interesting pattern on its tail, you can guarantee that at some point it's going to show that pattern to you somehow, whether it flies away or whether it's displaying, whether it's agitated or whether it's excited. So a, a bird with a tail pattern like this is guaranteed to show it to you at some point. <clears throat> Here you can kind of get a sense of why the tail is special. It's really pale at the base and the tip is black. So when it spreads it, it's quite uh, noticeable. Here again. This is not a common bird here, but something to be looked for. The more, the more familiar we are with it before we go birding, the more likely we are to recognize it if we happen to bump into it. American red start, the male is unmistakable for sure, but take a look at the young male or the female. These birds are harder to recognize, but really worth learning because this is uh, not, uh, not an extremely rare bird here. There was already a couple on uh, the San Mateo coast um, just last week, I believe, that last week and this week. So watch for that. So there are so many more uh, surprising fall birds to be searched for. Pretty much all of the warblers in North America have been found um, in the Bay Area at one point or another, including painted wren start. So lots of things to think about when you go birding during this time of year. I want to tell you a few places to go uh, to look for some of these birds. And where I like to go, Palo Alto Baylands. I probably wouldn't go there right now looking at this picture because I think the tide is awfully high and there, there wouldn't be any, there wouldn't be any uh, shorebirds there. 
But when the water recedes and the shorebirds rush in to feed on the mudflats, that would be the time I would go. But also these bushes here, this portion used to have many more fennel, uh, much more fennel growing in it. That's been removed. It still attracts a lot of uh, warblers and flycatchers, including willow flycatcher and chestnut sided warbler years ago. Coast Casey Forebay, all these areas are familiar, familiar to you, I'm sure, but look at them in a new light uh, tonight as we're talking about the themes of fall and what birds are looking for and why they go certain places and, and what they're finding when they go to these places. Here, we've got dense cover of the marsh, we've got shallow protected waters, and we've got uh, um, tons of birds that gather here from gulls to ducks to geese, to skimmers, to shorebirds, uh, even to warblers. And sparrows, I forgot to mention sparrows. Don Edwards, New Chicago Marsh. I'm fairly sure that one of you is gonna find a pectoral sandpiper and hopefully even a ruff here um, on the left of the road in the area where the vegetation and the uh, water come in contact. Scan that area with your telescope, look for your binocs. Uh, the high tide when the birds are pushed in from the bay because the mudflats have are now covered up with water, the birds might be resting in here or feeding, still feeding in this area. So that'd be a good place to go there. Don't forget the Don Edwards Butterfly Garden. Uh, many warblers and sparrows have been found here. Flycatchers and vireos have been found here during migration as well. Pretty much the whole uh, complement of fall birds have been found at Don Edwards. Whether you're looking at the mudflats, the marsh, the ponds, which are temporarily closed, or the butterfly garden. I think one time a long-eared owl was found here as well. Sunnyvale Baylands, this used to be one of my favorite spots to go, but I, I started to bird more at Eulostack. I still love Sunnyvale Baylands, this double row of cottonwoods, uh, which attract many warblers and flycatchers during fall. So I didn't even really mention things like black-headed grosbeak or western tanager or even are two orioles. They're flying through now, they're leaving the area, um, and they often are found in these cottonwoods. <clears throat> Eulostack, if you haven't been there, check it out. It's a marvelous place with, with hundreds of what we call edges um, between rows of trees and open trail, um, grassland, a bare earth, the water, the willows. Um, birds tend to uh, move along edges um, of habitats where two habitats touch each other. So that's the place where you're going to find the most diversity. And Eulostack is filled with such edges. The Sona Lake Park doesn't look like this right now, much less water there, but look at all the trees. Look at all the opportunities for birds to find insects, invertebrates, uh, all kinds of prey here, and seeds, of course, in the drier areas. Lake Cunningham Park. Um, what I like most is walking the periphery and looking at the trees, both native and non-native, along the edges, uh, back by the water slides. Uh, there have been many birds there, Eastern Phoebe, uh, Red, Fox Sparrow. Um, let me see what else, American Red Start. Um, lots of birds to be found in Lake Cunningham Park, especially in this area where uh, heavily forested. So remember to look for these features when you go to these spots. Look for the fennel, look for the persimmons, look for pistache, look for eucalyptus, look for willows, compost, and of course water. Because they all attract insects and, and the insects are magnets for migrants. So in summary, just before we wrap this up, autumn to me, and maybe to you too, is moving, changing, recovering, preparing, attracting, discovering, and surprising. These are all wonderful, exciting features of this marvelous birding season in Santa Clara County. And hopefully you'll be able to see examples of each of these themes when you go out birding, because fall really is the best time to go birding in my mind. And uh, uh, before we close up entirely, I wanna give you, uh, mention a few resources. I've spoken about this many, many times now, but I just want to mention to you that our checklist, our official checklist is downloadable from our website. 
And if you stop by the ranch, you can pick up a bound copy for yourself for free. Look at, if you haven't already, take a look at Cialia.com, S-I-A-L-I-A.com. And you will see all of the various list services compiled, all the list services from North America, compiled on this page daily. And if you click on the one that says South Bay Birds, you can see it at the top right there with uh, entry from Diane McCoy. She might actually be here tonight. And she wrote something about uh, the SCVS trip to Charleston Slough. And if you look down the list, you'll see some of the birds that we talked about tonight. Baird sandpiper, solitary sandpiper, bank swallow. We didn't talk about that. Foxes, swifts. These are all migrants. So the good place to look for look for places to go is to look at this list. I see Eve's name there. I see other people, Vicki Silvis Young, Chris Overington, I think he's here tonight. So uh, Gregory Luckert, I think he might be here tonight too. So anyway, take a look at that list, open those stories and, and read the people's reports. If you're lucky, they might have an eBird checklist included in that list or some advice about where to go, what time of day, where to park, etc. All those kinds of things are perfectly fine for the list service. There isn't, as much as I love Eber, there isn't really as much opportunity to put that kind of uh, narrative in an in a Eber checklist. You can, but I think there's something really nice about sending these emails and making them available. Outside birders from out of town love the list services. Look at our self-guided field trips. Uh, we've got many, we've got more than 100 self-guided field trips with uh, advice about where to go and what to look for. <clears throat> Allaboutbirds.org is a wonderful free site where you can get more details, more photographs, maps. You can hear the vocalizations of some of the sounds um, and you can see multiple plumages of all the birds we talked about. And eBird, particularly the Explorer section, um, this is a wonderful way to get information, and I use it um, constantly, not only researching where I'm going to go, uh, submitting my own reports, and also um, putting um, pu putting uh, presentations together like this one. So anyway, I wanted to thank you all for being here tonight, and I wanted to acknowledge Joan Miro for the beautiful title uh, painting that I love so much. And uh, the Cornell Lab of Ornithology and eBird, of course, I couldn't do... Uh, these presentations without those resources and Santa Clara Valley Audubon Society. So if you like tonight's presentation and want to hear more, our scvs.org slash scvs slash dash learn has a growing catalog of classes free and fee based. So uh, check that out, see what you can find there. We'll be doing more stuff coming up. Um, a segment like this on the season of winter something coming up on the tidal habitats, uh, just in time for December, I hope. And then a multi-part class on swimming birds uh, other than ducks. So uh, for that, I'm gonna open this up with a few questions from the class. <laughs>